Hi, so today is Monday, June 24th, 2024. My name is Hanson Sue, and I'm here with Steve Mayer. And so to begin with, um, uh, we'll start with where and when you were born. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1944. Thank you. And uh, where did you grow up? I got my streetwise in Chicago to about age nine, and then my family moved to uh, Redwood City, California, and where I grew up and until uh, I went away to college. Okay, so about what uh, period of time, like which decade was that? So I spent the 50s uh, and uh, the, the late 40s and the 50s in Redwood City, California. Okay. Um, what were your parents' backgrounds and occupations? My father did a preliminary offshoring. He would pick up insurance policies from San Francisco, and at those days, the insurance policies were typed with multiple layers of carbon, and he would pick up the insurance policies and deliver them to a home typist in Fremont, so that was offshoring. And then he would then return them to the insurance companies two days later. My mother was a bank examiner uh, and bank inspector uh, for B of A in East Palo Alto. Oh, wow. And did you have any siblings? Or do nope. you have any siblings? Only one. Oh, wow. Um, uh, what were your parents' uh, religious or political uh, backgrounds? Um, that my, uh, we had a, a split household. My father was a Republican, my mother was a Democrat. Uh, my, one of my earliest memories was sitting in her lap watching the McCarthy hearings uh, being broadcast. And uh, they were both uh, sec very secular Jewish. Oh, okay. And what were your favorite subjects at school? Well, my favorite subjects were outside of school. Uh, I would take my bicycle and go around the neighborhood and there would be ham radio antennas. Uh, and then underneath every one of those ham radio antennas was a 43-year-old whose own kids thought he was a complete dork. And I'd knock on the door and say, I'm gonna become the son you never had. So I started apprenticing with them. Interesting. So that was, that was your, your favorite hobby? It was, it was a hobby and it was actually um, a much more of an informal learner. So I actually learned technology that way. Uh, I became a ham radio operator when I was in sixth grade. Um, 10th grade, I had uh, put a TV station on the air and in my room I also had a radio teletype so I would get uh, the radio teletype transcriptions uh, sent out by Mackey Radio to Australia. And then um, I was able to watch and uh, uh, post the uh, radio teletype printouts from, uh, from the news corporations in the school uh, teacher's room so you could watch and follow the whole buildup of the Vietnam War. It was an amazing experience, but uh, people back in those days, uh, there were all these people working for Lockheed and stuff, and uh, they were willing to spend the time with young people and bring them into the trade. Oh, wow. Um, what sorts of books or media did you read or consume? Um, anything about electronics, so I started reading uh, the trade magazines uh, back in those days. And Ham Radio had its, its um, um, own uh, publications. And then transistors were just first coming out. So uh, uh, the companies that made transistors made training material. So uh, you could just uh, read this material. It, uh, these materials had made it into formal education. So there was large amounts of material for informal education as the valley was bringing the engineers up from tube technology to solid state technology. 
Great, thank you. Um, did you have any influential teachers or mentors or role models? Um, there was a fellow that I would go of after school every day. He was a, um, his name was uh, Farnsworth, uh, and he was a blind fellow that supported himself uh, tuning pianos. He was a ham radio operator, and uh, uh, he uh, taught me a lot about electronics. He also taught me a, a lot about very useful things, like if uh, you turn on the hot water to make tea, if you listen very carefully, when the pipes would change to the right temperature, they make the smallest amount of a squeak sound. So uh, I got a chance to uh, see the world a little bit through his ears. It's a mixed metaphor, but I think. <laughs> and who are your heroes growing up? Um, that we had a family meeting uh, when I was in the third grade when I decided to move from physics to engineering, and my, my hero is Robert Oppenheimer. I was a weird kid. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, talk about going to college. Where did you go to college, uh, undergraduate? Um, I, there's an argument how long I spent at Berkeley. Um, I went to Berkeley in 62, and somewhere between 62 and 64 I dropped out. There's an argument between Berkeley, my parents, and myself is exactly when I dropped out. But I got very good at bridge during that period. <laughs> um, and uh, so what, what, both how did, you, how did you decide to go to Berkeley and what, um, what was the reasoning behind dropping out? Um, well, Berkeley was the default. Uh, you know, the, the vision was MIT. Um, but I was, uh, uh, and that didn't seem like a good fit for me. Um, Berkeley had a, just a superb engineering school, and at that time they were doing an experiment with, it was called um, an advanced, um, um, an engineering advanced placement where you could take both engineering courses and liberal arts at the, for the first two years. Um, that it was also, uh, Berkeley was changing from uh, uh, the fair housing movement and it was just the start of Vietnam and I've been very politicized uh, based uh, on working on fair housing in the Palo Alto area and um, I was also working at, volunteer at a couple of uh, radio stations, uh, PBS stations and it was starting to make a, a documentary on the um, anti-war movement that was happening there. And it was just, it, um, for me to work on physics uh, uh, problems that have been solved a uh, hundred million times, dynamic carts rolling down uh, a ramp versus working on real world problems. I've always wanted to work on real world problems and see how I can make people's lives better. So a formal education wasn't for me. Also, as I said, um, there was a phase uh, transition when I went, first went to Berkeley. So um, electrical engineering was about motors and fields, and computer engineering was IBM 704s and punch cards, and digital and, uh, and solid state electronics just weren't coming in. So. The, uh, a lot of what was happening that was interesting was happening in the field. So I was able to drop out and actually uh, work uh, putting a, a TV station on the air, KCSM TV in, in San Mateo, and worked as uh, a TV producer during that period of time. Hmm. Um, so what was your major originally then? It was in, it was called um, engineering science where you could uh, take liberal arts degrees, but uh, um, the engineering uh, was, was 19th century engineering by far the most interesting courses there were sociology, 
and psychology, and, and that really helped me as, we, as I transitioned into working at Atari because people don't change. Uh, the play fields change, the rules are changed, and you have a computer that might be keeping score and becoming a play field. But all the dynamics and the motivation uh, behind that people have been studying in psychology and sociology, it all was playing out on video games. So I could take the classic psych experiments and then move them over to an electronic play field. Interesting. Um, so uh, you mentioned you, you were politically active at the time. Do you take part in any, any protests or the free speech movement? I was doing mostly doing documentary work. Um, I had the good fortune to be really, really bad at it. Uh, you save so much time in your life when the universe tells you, don't do this. Um, so I discovered that doing the production side of things was just not me. I had a TV program and, and a couple other things. But my love was actually making the tools and turning the tools over to the the real uh, artists and the real communicators that could tell a story. And so my whole career, my whole life is really uh, making tools for, for storytellers. Mm -hmm. And what was your first experience with a computer? Um, it was at Ampex uh, uh, that Al, Nolan and I were all working for uh, Ampex that made videotape recorders and there was a division of Ampex uh, that was bringing computers and video together for our document retrieval system. And uh, uh, we, I think the first computer that, I, uh, other than this IBM 704 and the punch cards, the first real com computer, the personal computer was a Nova, I think it was a 1200 that we uh, brought into Ampex and to program that. Uh, so we were doing, uh, r random digital logic circuits and bringing in a general purpose uh, uh, computer. Hmm. Okay. Um, so you mentioned um, so after you, after you dropped out, you you were work you were working for a, a radio station or well, I put uh, uh, radio and TV station KCSM uh, was just going on the air. And I had uh, the professional licenses for uh, for putting the station on the air, and it worked cheap. So uh, th th those were the main qualifications for working there, and it was great. So once uh, the equipment was on the air, then um, I would uh, alternate being as um, uh, doing some television production, some uh, tech work, and a little bit of teaching. Um, so talk about how you got from there to Ampex. Um, that uh, I, I, I wanted to, um, as I said, KCSM wasn't paying much of anything. I went to, to Ampex, which in those days, it was um, one of the premier companies in the Valley. And I went uh, into the HR department to take a job. They were, are looking for technicians. And the woman in the HR department took a liking to me. Her tape recorder at home wasn't working, so she said, uh, could I come over to her home and fix the tape recorder? And I did, and uh, she said, look, you're great and stuff. Um, I'm not gonna put you on the assembly line. I'll get you a job as a technician in the engineering department. So that my entry was into the tech department. Uh, was into the video file uh, R&D department. And then, as I said, um, digital was first coming in and Ampex was a bunch of analog engineers. They were all in their 40s, 50s, and 60s with swizzle sticks and pocket protectors. And the digital was coming in and they would uh, say to the young people, uh, here's the manual, figure this out. And Ampex had a long history of this. Ray Dolby, when he was in high school, used to bicycle over to Ampex and work there. And before he went off and became Dolby Labs, um, Steve uh, Allen uh, used to bicycle over 
uh, there. So Hampex uh, really just turned things over to young people and really encouraged them. Uh, but they, they felt the older people, their job was to teach the profession of engineering what it was to do quality work and to be responsible. And, but the technology, the young people could fi figure it out. Hmm. Uh, and what year did you start at Ampex? Uh, that was uh, around 65. Um, and uh, Ampex had got the, a program for a large document retrieval system. And so uh, by a s series of defaults, I became the project manager uh, for uh, this large project for Ampex. And by coincidence, uh, I worked with Bob Miner and, um, and a fellow that came in just after uh, I left, and that was uh, Larry Ellison, who both picked up uh, this document retrieval system. Interesting. So, so that was the main project that you were working on at the time? Exactly. It was, at the time, a, a large project that uh, uh, it tied uh, 12 police stations in the LA area, uh, of, and you could do remote fingerprinting of, of suspects. The images were sent into a centralized database. You could do matching of the Henry codes of the fingerprints and send the information back out to the local police stations before the people were released or booked. Huh. So this was all done using video technology? It was primarily video, because the vi um, we, uh, it, it was an analog technology, but kept a, a digital uh, a time track and digital track on the uh, videotape recorders so we could access individual frames. So each video frame was a fingerprint. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned, you know, several people that you met at Ampex. Um, you mentioned Larry Ellison, um, Al Alcorn. So t talk about, um, you know, meeting meeting all the people that you you met at Ampex. Well, Larry came in uh, just after I left. Uh, I'm not sure of this, but our, um, the exact things because Bob Miner was still there, but uh, we were starting to put in larger databases for searching the videotape recorders based on the time codes. And uh, I think Larry came in, uh, IBM had just uh, developed, I think, the SQL database languages. So Larry uh, really, along with Bob Miner, took the lead on that. And they both, uh, after Al and I and, and Nolan left uh, a time after that, they went out and left and started Oracle. And I think um, Oracle, I, I could be wrong of this, I think it was Object Relational Something Database for Law Enforcement. So that's how the Oracle name came out. I, I haven't been able to verify that in history. So if you run into or, Oracle people, uh, I'd be curious. So talk about um, meeting Nolan, Al Alcorn, and Ted Daphne at, at Ampex. Uh, so during lunch times, we would all play uh, games. Uh, so we play uh, uh, Go, Pinochle, Kriegspiel, Chess, uh, and any other possible games. So there was a small group of us, maybe half dozen, that played the games. Um, Nolan uh, was really the, the number one games player. I, I was a bit of a games player. My main contribution during those days is Nolan wanted to do uh, the game Computer Space as a G job at home, and I had some extra um, IC chips from the Los Angeles uh, Sheriff's Department project, so I got him some parts there uh, and sort of followed uh, his project. He, originally, he was going to do this using a, a small uh, mini computer, and Larry Bryan was going to be a a programmer for it, and he was going to do computer space. But the economics of that didn't work out, so Nolan uh, did computer space as essentially doing our, uh, our hard, hardware random logic 
uh, of the game. And he, he did that in, uh, during the off hours, and uh, there were a group of us that were following him. But he was really by far the number one games player of the group. Interesting. And, and Al Alcorn, um, you met him around the same time? Yes, he was coming in. He was, uh, I believe, that uh, he was at Berkeley and they had a work study program. So he was um, spending time at Ampex doing the, uh, the work study um, that I don't think Al ever went back. Uh, he just you know, fell in love with what he was doing there. Uh, Nolan, being Nolan, um, came in there as an engineer. This was his first job in engineering. And he'd been at Ampex for six months. And he went to his boss and, and said, as a career move, now that I've done engineering, should I move into marketing? That was you know, typical Nolan. <laughs> Um, and then uh, you also met Larry Emmons at yeah. Ampex? Yeah, Larry and, uh, and I, um, that, uh, uh, we were both more on the, uh, Larry was more on the analog side, the cameras, and we both didn't enjoy living in the valley. So uh, I, there was a company called uh, uh, Grass Valley Group up in the hills of Grass Valley that was doing uh, video technology. And from a quality of life standpoint, I went up there to talk with them. And there was a spin-off company called Arvin. And um, instead of having uh, you know, uh, the Silicon Valley commute and uh, a track home, I could get uh, 20 acres of land and build up uh, a small house up there. And so from quality of life standpoint, I went to uh, Larry and said, uh, look, uh, this Arvin company is completely wacko, but let's go there. Gets us up into the hills of California and we could do survive doing some consulting and start our own company. So um, where Nolan, because of his background, was uh, you know, he understood games because he had worked summers in the milk bottle toss. Um, I went up to Grass Valley with Larry, and we started uh, our G job of doing a read-write video disc using um, videotape technology. And, uh, and we were surviving uh, doing small engineering contracts while our product was being developed. Um, I came down one day. By this time, um, Nolan already left uh, Ampex uh, to do uh, first uh, computer space with Nutting Associates, and he was already started the second company, which was a Syzygy with, with Al. And Nolan said, Schmuck, what are you trying to do this hard stuff for? Uh, first of all, it's hard stuff. And second of all, even if you got it working, no one's going to care. And in a moment of brilliance, I said, his business plan was better than my business plan. So I ripped up my plan. And um, that moment of insight and brilliance was matched with a, um, an equally uh, ridiculous moment. Because he said, you could either work for a 5% commission or a salary of $25,000 a year. And $25,000 a year sounded like an awful lot of money. So I said, Nolan, uh, uh, Larry Emmons and I will work for $25,000 a year. So we, uh, he gave us a, first a couple of projects to work on. Uh, and uh, one was called Radio Controlled Pong, so that you could be in a bar and sitting at a bar and control a, a Pong game that was sitting above the bar. And then I did a a uh, really bad game called Gotcha. But uh, Nolan and, and Al um, stuck with us and, and offered us a full-time job. And uh, the co uh, concept was that Al, really great engineer, but he was right next to the factory. And this factory kept saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. We wanted to have an R&D arm that was um, a, 
a, a couple of hours distance rides so we could still work with the factory but we weren't spending all our time being eaten up by factory problems. So we became the advanced development arm for Atari and reported first through Al. Mm, okay. Um, so where exactly is Grass Valley located? Um, it's, um, if you draw a line between Sacramento and Reno, it's about a third of the way up there. It's in the low foothills of the Sierras, and it's in the gold country at about 3,000 foot elevation. Wow, nice. Um, did you know or interact with Steve Jobs or Steve Wozniak at any point? Um, sorry. Um, yeah, that um, this Al will give you the the amazing stories of uh, Steve coming in and and how he got hired to um, uh, to work on Breakout and do and all the other games. So Al's the keeper of that story. But uh, occasionally, uh, the two Steves and I would meet in the lab and and talk after hours and. Uh, since I had brought in the 6502 microprocessor to Atari and Woz was in love with that and things like that. So uh, we were having, um, uh, we got to know each other quite w well during that period of time. Where I really got to know um, Steve was uh, after, uh, uh, when I went to New York to um, when Atari was bought out by Warner, um, I started the Central Research Facility for Warner Communications, and um, I, and uh, Steve Jobs had come to uh, New York City to roll out desktop print publishing. He invited me there, and when I saw there, I saw the opportunity for desktop video publishing. So he and I spent a lot of time talking about that, and uh, Atari was about ready to completely crater in. So I arranged to spin out my lab in uh, from Warner as a startup and move it out to Silicon Valley. And Steve Jobs had arranged to give me a contract uh, to do desktop video publishing uh, for for. Uh, Apple, and so while the, my whole lab was in a U-Haul truck coming out, Steve had been just kicked out of uh, of Apple, so uh, we got there just in time for the good news of that. But uh, during that time, um, Steve and I talked about whether I wanted to be part of the founding um, members of the next computer, uh, mm -hmm. but I was committed to doing desktop video publishing. Uh, so I passed on that, but we maintained really good uh, connections along the way uh, during the next computer days and also when he was uh, buying uh, Pixar. So I was there with him on that because I was looking to buy SoundDroid at the same time uh, to be part of the, the desktop uh, video part of it and then when he um, went back to um, Apple, he asked me if uh, I wanted to first help him on Final Cut Pro and then whether I wanted to be a chief engineer of Apple. Uh, I knew enough about uh, Steve that he would just eat me up. Uh, I'm too much of a pussycat for him. So uh, yeah, I said, as much as I like what you're doing, uh, that wasn't going to work out. My last contact with, with Steve was in 2002 uh, with Screaming Match. I tried getting him to do uh, a telephone and he said, over my dead body, Apple will never do a telephone. But uh, that was classic Steve in the sense that I had this image of where what it might be, but Steve had the sharpest Occam's razor of anybody unless he could uh, grok the, every part of it, and if everything wasn't ready to happen, and if he couldn't see the whole thing, why spend uh, one microsecond of your time you know, thinking about stuff and, 
until it was ready to happen. And um, I didn't have the uh, human interface worked out yet I was, uh, because the multi-touch hadn't been worked out. So mine was going to be, the idea was to uh, use voice. And also the carriers weren't very good uh, at that point. So it was going to be, um, Apple was just introducing airport. So it was going to be uh, a thin client of your Apple computer on your desktop. And it would be a, a portable phone that you could use around your home or around your office. But it wasn't something hooked up through cellular because uh, cellular just didn't have the chops at that time for it. Wow, fascinating. Um, yeah, that uh, jumped a little bit far, farther ahead than I expected. <laughs> Um, let's go back to the the seventies. Um, so, talk about um, how did the 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 VCS project come about? Um, that Al, uh, excuse me, sorry about this. Um, Al realized that you could. Atari was based on location based entertainment, coin op machines, and Al uh, realized that the intersection of semiconductor technology allowed to take Pong and do a custom chip. Um, and, but in those days, doing a custom chip was an incredible amount of grief. Uh, you had to manually print out uh, the floor plan of the chip, and there was no CAD CAM. You had to m just check things out. And it was really hard. So he did the first. Uh, consumer version of Pong that was successful at home. And then uh, we had a, another couple of games that were coming out, uh, Stunt Cycle and others, and he had to do a custom chip for that too. And each one of those custom chips was just a lot of work and it wasn't scalable. So I had seen um, the HP calculators, the 35 and the 45, and Inside the HP 35 and the 45 was the same silicon, and they would just change the ROM to, to say whether it was going to be a, a business or an engineering calculator. So my original idea was uh, you could just change the ROM, you know, an internal ROM, and this could be one game versus another game. Um, and uh, uh, the problems there is so. The initial concept was not with interchangeable cartridges. That only happened a couple of weeks into the project when we said, okay, let's, let's put the cartridge connector on the outside. But the hard thing of that was uh, for consumers, you have to hit a price point. And Pong at Sears had set a price point of $189. So if we were going to do the VCS, how, what can you do for $189? And that might sound a lot of money, but if you take $189 and you say Sears is going to get the top $70 of it, and then you have to allow for profit of Atari and shipping and this and this and this, it said the microprocessor could only be about $10 and the graphics chip could be only about $8. So that was the budget. So we had a paper design of what this might look like, but there was no a computer chip that could meet our performance and our price standpoint. Um, in order to do the chip, uh, also from a graphics standpoint, we couldn't, uh, normally frame buffers were complete two-dimensional horizontal ver vertical things, and we couldn't afford all that memory. Uh, the VCS, including all the memory for graphics, all the memory for uh, the computer stack, all the memory for, working memory for the games was a total of 128 bytes uh, because we were in such a tight constraint. Uh, uh, my co-inventor of the VCS, uh, Ron Milner, uh, he did primarily the sound part of it. I did the video part of it. Went to a Westcon show and uh, MOS Technology and Chuck Peddle came out with the chip and it just barely hit the price points and the performance point that uh, we were looking for for the white paper. 
Uh, he was selling the chips by the, the barrel full. I didn't realize he only had one barrel of chips you know, in the whole world. This is the 6502? This is the 6502. Uh, so um, that Ron and I quickly came back, got one of the chips, and over six weeks we built the, the prototype of the VCS, and we showed it to Alan uh, Nolan, um, and, uh, you know, and I programmed maybe the first half dozen benchmark games to show the range of what could be done on the, on the system. Then Al uh, uh, would, was going to take over the project. Um, one of the uh, great inventions of Atari at that time was it, there's always a problem of how do you move a project out of from, in, uh, from advanced development into engineering, because that, that was always Star Wars followed by The Empire Strikes Back. So we brought in a technician, uh, a young engineer, Joe DeCure, and he came up to speed in the project. So we shipped the, the basic design, and Joe DeCure, who had grokked the, the essence of the project, Al put together a wonderful integrated circuit design team. He also worked with MOS technology you know, to find second sources to the chips. We, he first tried seeing whether we could use one of the main sources of chips. So Intel wouldn't do it for the price point or the performance point, and uh, Motorola wouldn't do it. So we were stuck with MOS technology. So Al arranged to uh, get them up to production and arrange for multiple sources and did all the, the back work uh, to turn it into a product. Um, one of my favorite uh, cartoons was in the New Yorker. It's two he uh, uh, be beavers at the foot of Hoover Dam said, well, I didn't actually build it. I had the original concept. So the idea is, uh, and we really had that Atari is, no one person could build it. It was handing the baton over to the next people and handing the baton over to Al. You know he was going to take it and do an incredible job on it. Hmm. Wow. Um, could you talk a little bit about the design of the, the Stella chip? So what, uh, the idea was that um, it, it was how you could cut the cost down. We couldn't afford memory. Uh, so the idea is we were going to invest with the fastest microprocessor we could possibly do and then lock it tightly to the TV screen. So. Um, if you think of the world now in supply chains, if you wanted to have a large warehouse, you had four weeks of inventory, that cost you a lot of money to have an inventory. So for keeping up with the TV set that kept saying, I need lots and lots of information very fast, uh, you either had a lot of memory where you could put all the information in there and the TV could take it out, or what we did is we locked the microprocessor to the scan rate of the TV so that the microprocessor during the horizontal retrace could figure out what needed to be displayed on the next line. So it only had to keep one line of information. So uh, the amount of memory, instead of being a, a two-dimensional matrix, which uses up lots of storage pretty quickly, it was only a one-dimensional problem. But it had to be a microprocessor that could figure out of, from a gameplay standpoint and a graphic standpoint, everything that needs to be displayed in those 50 microseconds. So we pioneered the idea of line buffers in, in our arcade games. So one of the advantages of Atari is that we had location-based entertainment where we could prove out technology uh, at a different price point, and also more importantly, we could uh, try out game concepts, and people paid a quarter to fill out our questionnaire of whether it was a good game or not. You just count the quarters and say, this is a good game. Uh, so uh, uh, we were already up to speed with the technology, so it's how you can match that technology to hit that, that incredibly tight price point. Mm, okay. And so that ship, the, what became the TIA, 
that was um, primarily designed by? Uh, that um, I did the video part of it, and Ron did the audio part of it, and we d implemented it with MSI, and then we could give the uh, meme scale integration, you know, uh, the equivalent of maybe a chip that would have maybe four gates in it or a four bit counter. And we would then send that down, and then Joe DeCure and Jay Minor and some other people would then turn that into a, a transistor implementation and then to a chip layout implementation of that. Uh, the okay. advantage of the whole thing was uh, by just incredible serendipity, we didn't have the time and the money to over design it. So it was. Uh, it was uh, such a minimalist design that it played not only the games we knew about, but even four years later, it could do the games that were coming along, uh, like uh, Space Invaders. Because uh, if, if we had had a larger budget, we would have over-designed it, and it wouldn't have been nearly as flexible. But the idea of having a fast microprocessor tied to the TV screen, no operating system, and nothing else, it allowed the future programmers to work with essentially microcode and do their magic. Okay, the Stella chip uh, uh, was a custom layout chip. I think it had, uh, Al could probably get the exact number, but it was the equivalent of maybe of 70,000 gates. Uh, the RAM that we had external to the, the chip was 128 by, bytes of, of RAM, and that was divided sort of half for the computer stack and half of it to do the gameplay and, and the graphics creation. Uh, the memory cartridge, it had no uh, read-only memory, but uh, the memory cartridges could be either 2K bytes or 4K bytes along the way, uh, which was the state of the art. Um, the chip costs were set by the number of pins as well as the number of gates that it had, so we were incredibly limited to how many address lines, how many data lines. So uh, we were fighting the technology, fighting for every cent that we could do to hit this price point. Right. So how, how much did the chip and the RAM cost um, at I, the time? I think the, um, the microprocessor, uh, I think, Originally was a little more expensive. I, I think it might have been of, of twelve dollars, and then it had to get down to the eight dollars. I think the TIA was maybe eight dollars. So I think we had like a about a sixteen dollar budget for all the the silicon. Hmm. And one hundred twenty eight bytes of RAM. How much did that cost? Uh, that was built in uh, to the. Uh, uh, I, there was. Uh, an, uh, there was a chip that came with the MOS technology that included I.O. ports and a few other things. So we had the choice of either having more RAM or less RAM. Um, the one thing that limited us more than anything else was the cartridge connector. Uh, we never brought out more address lines to the cartridge connector. So uh, it really wasn't that expandable. Because uh, our idea was it was only going to do uh, a couple of, you know, the, a small series of games. It was going to last in the marketplace for a couple of years, and then we would go on to the next thing. Uh, it was right. a complete surprise to us. Um, a lot of the success to that was not because of Atari being um, great. It was Atari being lucky. Um, so. The first part of the success of this was that Atari was always short of money. Um, we, we built a, a, the company collecting quarters and using that to pay our distributors for parts. Um, when it came time to do consumer, Sears provided us the original money so that we could do the consumer pong, but to do the VCS required more money. and. Um, our business model was always to be bought up by uh, Disney, but Disney never wanted to buy us out. Uh, but when we had the VCS prototype, uh, the people at Warner, because they had Warner movies, Warner records, and stuff like that, 
that was hitting their sweet spot. They could understand, you know, record players and, and records. So they saw what this might be, and that's when they got interested, and that's why they bought Atari, and they gave us the money to scale up uh, doing the first production. But also, they were also smart about licensing deals. So until, um, you know, uh, uh, Space Invaders and, and games like that, all the games that we did in the uh, out in location and for the consumer were all games that were designed by Atari and the Atari engineers. But now that Japan was bringing out amazing games with an entirely different sensibility, they were opening up whole new segments to the game playing industry because of uh, the Japanese sense of fun and graphics and things like that. The Warner people understood that they could cut a deal with the Japanese manufacturers for the home uh, rights to these games. And because we had the only platform that could play those home games, because we had the only programmable platform, we were able to get the licenses for Space Invaders and um, and all the these great Japanese the games they asked uh, that came afterwards. So it, it, it was a, a change of, of of movement from being our own internal technology company to being a company that took advantage of the uh, of Warner's understanding of markets and advertising. So the games that we knew and the industry we knew could get us the first couple of hundred thousand. VCS sales, but it was Warner coming in and the luck of that that took it into uh, the world phenomenon that been and uh, looking back on it, Atari was became the fastest growing company in the world at that time. We had had re name recognition second only to Coca-Cola and I think 80% of the ROMs in the world were going into our products. It was it was just, um, it was an incredible ride. Wow. Um, talk, to, talk about how, um, why was Sears such an important distributor? Um, people now don't appreciate it, but Sears in those days, if you were to wrap um, Amazon, Walmart, and the internet and put them all together, that's what Sears was. And the Sears catalog that they mailed out, which was about this thick, um, was the, the shopping catalog of the times. Uh, about half of all Sears sales was through the catalog. They were the premier distributor. So it's hard to imagine what influence they had. You could buy from Sears, not only the craftsman tools, you could buy whole homes that were kit built uh, you could buy ducks and they would mail them out to you. It was, it was the whole world in shopping. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to imagine these days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then for Sears, um, for them to put us on their catalog and on the back page of the Christmas catalog, uh, to go out, uh, there was no, you know, consumer electronics like we know it here. Uh, they essentially created that kind of catalog, and because of them and because of Atari, we moved uh, consumers and and software to the Silicon Valley. So that's one of the reasons why Atari became um, uh, not only successful, but we created a benchmark for the venture capital community and the spin-off communities um, you know, to open up software companies that could go direct to consumer. So when you think of all the uh, internet companies that came out of the valley and the VC companies, they wouldn't uh, uh, invest in, in companies like ours. They would, in, in the days when Atari started, they would invest in Intel, it was engineers in black shirts and white ties, or biotech, it was hard technology companies. So a consumer company, an entertainment company was just so out of their 
uh, their strike zone. Mm -hmm. But I understand that there was an investment from Don Valentine at Sequoia. Yeah, Don um, was, he took the, uh, uh, the risk with us. He, uh, he got us uh, s some investments early on, relatively small in the couple of million dollar range, but um, he helped keep us going along the way. Um, and because of, of Don, Al and Nolan introduced Jobs and Wozniak to Don, uh, and also Al introduced uh, uh, the two Steves to uh, uh, Synertech for the MOS technology. So we help uh, primarily through Al and a bit through Nolan helped Apple get started through those contacts. Mm -hmm. But it, it was alien stuff to the Valley at the, those times. Uh, uh, it, it was a strange culture match. I wasn't there at the meetings, so Al has the stories, but um, uh, the, the, as Al tells it, the Sears people came out to see just what they were going, they were going to write a contract for a, a couple hundred thousand of these VCS, of these consumer pongs to this strange company. So they came out to visit the company to do their due diligence. So they came out at eight o'clock in the morning to visit the factory. And what do you see at eight o'clock in the morning in Silicon Valley? Either empty parking lots or people, programmers that were there from the night before. Um, 10 o'clock, the people from the factory and, and the front office people started wandering in. And it was just a strange mix because the Sears people were in the suits and the Atari people were in the blue jeans. And Al and Nolan tell the story that they agreed to the Sears people to come back that night. And by the time they came back that night, the Sears people had bought blue jeans and the Atari people had bought Sears suits. So, <laughs> but, uh, but it was it was the Sears at that time that was willing to take the risk, uh, and a unsung hero of this whole story was a buyer at Sears named Tom Quinn, who's recently passed on. But he staked his whole career on the Silicon Valley company that had virtually nothing, and for him to uh, commit for a purchase order for a couple of hundred thousand consumer pongs to uh, commit the Sears um, back page of the Christmas catalog to arrange for a line of financing for Atari because we couldn't build those couple hundred thousand units based on our financing. Um, you know, he was one of the great heroes of, our, of the story. Okay, so... Um yeah, so I wanted to hear more about uh, designing the combat game. So the original white paper that I did of what the, the VCS had to do, it had to play um, Pong, the four-player four called Quadra Pong. It had to do um, a, a tank game where two tanks could go around shooting at each other uh, through a maze, a flying game. And, um, and our concept of thinking of the Sears ad, uh, it had to do 50 games in the first cartridge. Uh, uh, they were all mind-numbingly similar with small changes in the graphic, but we had an idea of what the ad was supposed to be, you know, 50 games for $189. Uh, so I did the first cartridge to just see uh, you know, how far you could do it. So each game could only be maybe um, 50 or 100 bytes different from the next game. And so it was all about quantity and not quality. <laughs> I think that uh, when I sent the cartridge down, they recoded the cartridge, but it was really a proof of concept of what, what the game could do, you know, it was straight out of the chute. Right. We had no idea at the time that a clever programmer could uh, have it play chess, for instance. 
Uh, the idea of 128 bytes for everything to play chess, uh, that it wasn't a, a good game of chess. It was more uh, of like the dog playing chess. Uh, and the people said, that's amazing the dog plays chess. And you just said, it's not so amazing. It always loses. <laughs> so, uh, but we wanted to explore, at least to give, as we sent the unit down to Sunnyvale for programming, to see what it might do and to see their, their imagination of what was possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Sunnyvale. So is that, that, was that where the main Atari campus was? Exactly. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk, to ask about how, you know, how, how was the Grass Valley R&D Center, um, well, like how was it managed or how was it organized? And then, um, and then how was it, you know, the relationship between Grass Valley and Sunnyvale or the larger company? Yeah. Um, we um, were mostly around 10 to 11 people. Um, my partner, Larry Emmons, the, we found cyan engineering. He did prim primarily uh, the administrative and he was a, just a superb analog engineer. We we started out mostly as uh, equals, but because his expertise was more on the analog side uh, and the world was going digital, he took over a lot of the administrative stuff and I, I thank him for that. Um, and uh, there was one other engineer uh, primarily and that was Ron Milner. And he and I would do primarily the digital things then we had a couple of technicians for building the prototypes. Uh, we had somebody that was pretty good with sound and pretty, somebody that was pretty good with, um, with uh, graphics. And we had a, um, a, a layout printed circuit board designer. So that was uh, Grass Valley. Uh, we reported in first through uh, Larry Emmons and later on through Steve Bristow. And um, once a month, either Larry and I, Larry or I would fly down because Larry and I both had airplanes and we would fly down to visit the company or Al who had an airplane would fly up to Grass Valley and once every couple of months we would, um, we would all meet together and kick around ideas. Um, we were, uh, Nolan was, was more the idea business, business person and he was more the, the rooter for things that uh, we would come up with ideas for games and Nolan would, would say yes or no. By this time, Al, who is a superb engineer, uh, just had this factory and his engineering team to feed. So he really didn't have much time to do hard engineering for himself. But his love was uh, chip design. So. When the opportunity came to do a custom chip, the first custom chip for the company, he took that on as a project. But mostly, he would match. We uh, we would build a a, a prototype or a, a, a model, uh, a wire wrap model. We would send it down to his team, who would do, would uh, do the final engineering on it and put it into production. So our job was to come up with new game designs, but mostly to push the architecture and to incorporate um, new technologies. So uh, we did the first driving game, and the first driving game had a ROM memory in it with a state machine, so that was new to Atari. And we were able to solve the uh, vehicle dynamics equations using a model of using additions that Howard Gardner used in Scientific American for solving differential equations by just doing successive ads. Um, so we would, and Ron did the first shooting game um, with uh, an optical uh, gun. So we would do the, try bringing in new technology. Um, when the first microprocessors were coming out, the Intel 4004, he couldn't keep up with a video game, so we modified a ballet pinball machine and showed how it could replace uh, electromechanicals for doing pinball machines, and that became 
the basis for Atari getting into the pinball business. Hmm. Wow. Um, something that I forgot to ask about earlier is, it, um, were, were you aware of the, uh, the Fairchild Channel F while you were working on the VCS, or were these independent? That was completely the independent. independent. The only thing I knew of was uh, the analog uh, Magnavox Odyssey, which was you know, an analog device that had limited capability, and the very first video game that I know of, uh, Winky Dink. Do you know about Winky Dink? Uh, no. It was in the 1950s, early 60s, and you put cellophane over the, the, the tube of your TV, and, uh, uh, and there was a live action uh, and, and cartoon a TV show, and you could say, can you help Winky Dink? So you take your marker pen on the cellophane and mark it on the, on the screen of your TV, and the kids, when they couldn't find the cellophane, would just mark it on the front of the TV. Uh, so the Fairchild, uh, that I only became aware of that later on, I think, when the patent issues started uh, becoming an issue. So I don't know whether Al knew about uh, um, the Fairchild or not. Um, Al is the greatest engineering manager I've ever seen. Knew how to uh, protect us and just say, Go ahead and design, and and he he would take care. He would give us enough information so we knew what we needed to know and how it would fit into the company, and not uh, so much information that would slow us down from doing the inventing. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned um, you know the games coming from Japan, like Space Invaders. Um, could you talk about how Atari responded to the competition from Japan? Uh, so, um, two things. One, in our, uh, Atari had its own DNA, so um, the games that we did tend to be um, uh, driving games and driving um, on the ground, drive, you know, flying through space, things like that, and um, soft shooting games. We tend not to do violent games, but that was in our DNA. Um, the Japanese, uh, I think partially because of their history of anime and things like this, particularly Nintendo that had been doing uh, cards since, you know, for 80 years or 100 years, had a much better sense of fantasy games uh, and role-playing games. Um, so um, Atari never competed at location base with those kinds of games. Um, when it came time that these games became super popular um, that uh, Manny Gerard, who is the president of Warner, actually licensed the games for the home market. And that turned into a really tough conversation with Sunnyvale engineers. Uh, the Sunnyvale engineers are saying, you know, how, you're, you're, you're spending the money for these outside engineers and these, these games. And, Manny said, if you gave me those games, I wouldn't have to do it. So it was a really uh, tough, tough uh, time for it. And uh, it, never, it, it exacerbated the split between Sunnyvale and the engineers there and the Warner people in New York. And there was uh, uh, a strong cultural difference between the two, uh, Manny and Al try bridging that um, difference, but it was really hard. And by this time, Nolan had left to enjoy the, the, the richly earned rewards of, of Warner buying Atari. So he was out having a good time. So we lost uh, the keystone of our cultural DNA, which was Nolan. Um, Al did as much as he possibly could to hold things together and I did a, you know, I tried as much as I could also, but without Nolan there and um, Atari was being, was being moved from um, a niche company with a little of, of location-based entertainment, doing a little bit of consumer into 
a, a really significant company that was uh, doing uh, was doing billions of dollars a year uh, in business, was a major contributor. I think half of Warner's bottom line came from Atari, so it was no longer business as usual. Of let's, you know, a bunch of young engineers having a good time, and if it didn't work, so what? And then also there was a major shift where uh, what was the value added from an engineering company? Uh, the Atari DNA was the value added was the Atari engineers, the Atari creativity, the Atari game developers. And now the value added was licensing games from around the world and marketing. And we were bringing in people, product managers. And so it was a very a tough cultural shift. Um, I just wanted to clarify, what do you mean by location-based games? Uh, these are arcade games. So they would go into uh, uh, supermarkets, bars, 7-Elevens, Greyhound bus depots, and uh, they were, you put a quarter in them, and they were controlled by uh, local zoning where you could locate the games. Um, and that was, okay. that was the start of our company and allowed us to pioneer new g games and uh, new technologies at a, a thousand to three thousand dollar price point and with different expectation and we could see what worked and didn't work. And then we could then take the best of those games. So those were like the movie theaters and the multiplex theaters. And then, based on that, they could then go into to the home with the, the VCS. Um, so yeah, we were talking about the um, the the changes to to the company after the Warner acquisition. Um, is there anything else you would like to expand on that? Um, maybe discuss um, you know the leadership style of of you know. Uh, Ray Kassar, the new CEO? So um, Ray came in, he, under, he came from a marketing background. His, uh, he was uh, selling cotton shirts, I think it is, and linens. Um, he understood marketing. Um, so, and he could take a product that was well established and turn it in and <clears throat> take it to the next level and the next level. But neither um, uh, Ray or Manny Girard had the experience of technology changing. When was the last chance time that uh, technology changed in the movie business, in the, in the record business? It didn't happen that often. Um, uh, uh, Nolan was surprised by the VCS. He thought it would only last three years, and then uh, Atari would replace them. Um, that it lasted longer than that because of the Japanese games, but um, um, when Nolan left, um, Al and I tried to uh, explain to Ray and to Manny that, uh, that technology changes, you go through generations, a seven-year-old is not the same as a 14-year-old, is the same as a 21-year-old. Uh, uh, a three-year-old technology, semiconductor technology is starting to get long in the tooth. But they had brought in all these people from Procter & Gamble. When was the last time that Crest or, you know, it changed a formulation? Their idea of a major change in an industry is Palmolive going from a 42 share to a a 44 share. So uh, uh, for them to understand that it could go from 100% to zero or to actually negative, we had quarters where our gross revenue was actually negative because stuff was coming back, more stuff was coming back than we were shipping. And they didn't understand that the world could change that much. But Nolan, Alan, myself, we understood these things. but. Um, 
um, neither Al and I had the, the skills how to communicate that to the Warner people. Um, and the company was just so successful. So how do you argue with you know these Cassandras saying everything's going to change? But Al and I uh, could look in the labs and you could see what was going to happen. You look in the labs and you know what's going to happen two years from now. And, and we've been around long enough to know when the salespeople renegotiate their sales contracts, you know something's happening in retail. Because the salespeople are smart. They're not smart on semiconductor design, but they know what's happening at retail. So, but it was hard for a Warner to understand this. They saw this as this industry that would just keep going on and on and on. And they had never gone through what it was like to introduce a whole new cycle, a whole new platform. Um, Nolan came back to try connecting with, a, uh, with Warner after he had his uh, period of, of having a good time. But the company was a very different company by that point, so uh, he didn't have the creds for doing that. Um, so those of us that have been around early from the beginning tried holding you know, the, to the old Atari, but it was, a, it was not going to be an easy battle. Mm -hmm. um, so I understood that um, you got a new title under Warner? Oh, a bunch of titles. Um, I still get my title at Atari um, and um, as a um, senior VP and things like that and tried uh, helping out the divisions there. But I started a, a central resource facility for all of Warner because there was records movies and things like that. And it was based on the RCA, or the CBS, actually the CBS model of, uh, of labs. Um, I had this idea that I could come to New York and come there with the Atari magic and, and uh, change all these operating divisions. I didn't understand that. I thought of, I was going to be an asset to all these other Warner divisions, they saw me as a cost center. So uh, <laughs> from my standpoint, it was really great because I got a chance to meet with the Warner publishing people and to understand book publishing from the 1400s, the, the movie people, the record people. And uh, I got a sense of video games as a new publishing and a new storytelling medium. And the first one that had really come out since the uh, early 1900s, because you take print, started in early 1400s or mid 1400s, and start really coming into its age in the 1550s, movies and records, 1870s, and the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, it starts coming into its own. You look at Steamboat Wilty, Willie, and the Disney people had discovered everything we discovered about storytelling with animation and how you get to, together with that. So I started seeing how what we were doing in the context of it's always a good story well told. Um, the tools are different, the technologies are different, and there's the famous quote, uh, we form the tools and then the tools form us. So having the opportunity to be a tool builder for these new platforms was great, and I could see the new stories that could be told, but um, I, Atari was just churning money like mad, and the hardest thing in the world is to convince people that the world's going to change and to start building new platforms and trying new things when there was so much coming in supporting the old stuff. Um, the uh, ET cartridge came about because Steve Ross wanted to get Steve Spielberg to start doing more movies with Warner. So he cut a deal with Spielberg to do ET and without any sense that the heart of that movie was the emotional connection and what we could do with the technology didn't match what the movie was about. 
and then there was also a Christmas coming up, and there was enough there wasn't enough time to do a good game development. So the the cartridge was bad. I had when I was back in New York with the lab. I did consumer testing on the ET, and you could tell it was going to be a, a really bad cartridge. But people. But people don't want to hear that it's really bad because they knew that because of the marketing cloud, Warner could sell umpteen million cartridges. Uh, they had done the, the same thing with Pac-Man, which was an okay game. The implement, it was a good game, but with an, only an, an okay, okay implementation. So they said, don't worry, based on our marketing, we could sell them. But we had lost the, the DNA, which was, oh, Atari, which was our connection with the games player, the trust with the games player. And yes, we could make money, but you don't destroy one of the great consumer brands of all time. I want to go back and talk about the, um, the 8 bit home computers, the 400 and 800. Um, so, talk about how, how did that project start? Um, it started uh, that I was going to do the follow-on for the VCS, and it was going to be hitting the $180 price point, and um, and had um, a, a little bit of computer kinds of things, but it was mostly a games player that was going to be cartridge compatible with the VCS, um, and then Apple started coming out, uh, and. Um, Nolan had passed on uh, getting a share of, of, uh, of Atari buying a part of Apple. And uh, so Al and Nolan came up uh, to Grass Valley. I showed him the basic architecture and he said, do you want this to be more of a computer or do you want this to be more of a home game? You know, two different price points, two different technologies and stuff like that. And um, they made the mistake, and I allowed them to make the mistake, in these, which was to say yes. So it was compromised from both standpoints. As a home game, it was compromised because home electronics had to match a very tough uh, FCC requirement uh, for radiation and things like that. And you couldn't do uh, a home computer with plug-in uh, boards and stuff hanging out of it and still meet the FCC requirement. And Al had worked so hard and realized how hard it was to pass the FCC and one of his contributions to the VCS was uh, making the, uh, the, the VCS compatible under the FCC requirements. So we had to make this unit so it wasn't expandable. And also, it had to have um, an external battery charger eliminator. It couldn't have a power supply in, and it couldn't have plug-in boards for expansion. So, and it had to go on to the home TV. So the home TV limits you to 40 characters if it's coming in through the uh, RF port. And for a home computer, you wanted to have 80 characters across. Um, Apple didn't worry about any of those things. Uh, they didn't have to hit the, uh, a consumer games price point. They put in a really good power supply. They said the heck with the FCC, and they just went ahead and did it. Um, so as a home computer, it wasn't expandable. It didn't do the 80 characters. You had all these battery eliminators uh, chargers around them and things like that. So it, it was a, a, a really good implementation, but severely limited by the constraints. As a video game, a replacement for the VCS, it didn't hit the $189 price point. Uh, it didn't hit it because it had all these extra things. And also, our um, manufacturing engineering people got kind of lazy at the standpoint. When we did the VCS, we fought for every penny. By the time we were doing the home computer, okay, let's just go out and source a keyboard for $20 instead of 
working hard and and what Commodore did was they were able to find a keyboard for like six or eight dollars that was perfectly adequate. So we lost the hunger to hit the price points. We had lost the hunger to uh, define who the customer was. And so we had a compromised customer. It was also a change in um, the regulatory days. Nixon, Richard Nixon came in as president and the ideas of the FCC uh, shutting people down for radiation disappeared. It, uh, the days of being able to doing patent protection, uh, which was considered antitrust in the days of the VCS, we had the choice when we were doing the video game and the home computer of putting in security like Nintendo has, mm -hmm. so only uh, licensed cartridges uh, could play on our device. During the pre-Nixon days, that was considered restraint of trade, so we never did that. Uh, but we could have done it, so we didn't understand that the world was changing from a regulatory standpoint. So we had a compromised product from, from both standpoints. Um, good people working on it, but whenever you're working on a product, you have to know who your customer is. And one of the great things of Steve Jobs, he had, again, the sharpest Occam's razor of anybody. Uh, it was in or out. It was, you put it in, did it right, or it didn't exist. You didn't try loading stuff in. Um, and so these were, they were good implementations, but they lacked the sharpness of knowing who the customer was and being very targeted. Um, okay, so we're talking about the 400 and 800. Um, so was it the same team that worked on the, the home computers as the VCS? Uh, pretty much, yes. Uh, that uh, the team got a little bit larger, but it, re it really was essentially the same team. Okay, so you and, and Ron Milner? Yes, we did the primary the uh, uh, the graphics section. Uh, Joe DeCure and Jay Miner uh, did the um, a lot of the I/O and 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 some of the systems engineering, and then also saw it to the uh, doing the chips. Okay. Um, and and you said that the. Um, the so the home computers were were kind of an evolution of the VCS architecture. Is that correct? Um, I try keeping uh, the uh, keeping the core of the VCS and then expanding it because I wanted to ha have it so the, the old cartridges could still play on it. So we increase uh, um, increase the clock speed, but in a way that was a multiple of the previous clock speed, um, and. Uh, kept uh, some of the player objects and things like that uh, so that it, it was possible to uh, do backfilling the cartridges, it, that it could be cartridge com compatible, and from a programming standpoint, uh, it would match a lot of the uh, programmers, uh, so it was an easy transition over into the, into the new technologies. Okay. Um. And could you talk about the differences between the two models, the 400 and the 800? Uh, that essentially the, the, the big, there's only two big differences. One had a full stroke keyboard versus a, a membrane keyboard, and one had uh, more memory and um, an extra expansion cartridge, but inside they were virtually identical. Okay. Um, and you, you, you know, you're talking about how they were um, maybe a compromised design, but how successful in the market were they? Um, that they, um, they were moderately successful, but uh, they really were eaten up by uh, coming from three different directions. Um, the Apple, because it was fully expandable. Uh, and so 
Uh, the secret in the magic of the apple was you could drop in those cards and make it anything you wanted. You wanted it to be a MIDI controller, you wanted it 80 characters, you wanted more RAM, it was all there. Um, and um, Woz did a really good job on that. And, um, and then Radio Shack with their Trash 80 and Commodore with their VIC-20. Uh, the VIC-20 was all about cost. Uh, it was, I th think, a, a couple hundred dollars. They, they said, it's a learner computer. Um, it turns out um, when people were buying a computer in those days, they didn't know what it was for. So the only differentiation between a computer was two things. Did it have a full stroke keyboard or not? And how much memory it had? It's, it's like the equivalent of this camera is better than that camera because it has more pixels. Um, uh, so during the early days, how much RAM and did it have a, a full stroke keyboard? Um, Apple, because it was from Waz's DNA, was expandable and from the hobbyist standpoint, and uh, they just hit the sweet spot for that growing forward. And I heard that there was an attempt to create an add-on to the VCS to turn it into a computer? Yeah, there was uh, a couple of things. So uh, there was um, there was uh, two com well, there was a couple of companies that were doing it. So it was a cartridge that had additional memory and a stripped-down basic cartridge. Um, uh, that was w one of my negotiations uh, early on with uh, Bill Gates was uh, to get their uh, basic, f either for uh, the home computer or for the VCS. And it was, the idea there was just going to be a, a learning device uh, for uh, teaching uh, about games. Um, I was doing one other thing that I wish that Atari hadn't exploded at the time because it was going to be, uh, it was going to be just fun. Uh, Fisher Technic, uh, I don't know if you know them, they're like Legos, and they're, but the German form of the Legos, and I was negotiating a contract with them of doing a construction set of tying the VCS to the Legos, and hmm. it would have been just plain fun to do. Um, so I, so, you know, in my research, I discovered like there were, there were a number of other attempts to, to turn consoles into compute home computers as well. Like, um, the imagination machine yeah. was one of them. Um, a television plan to make the television one. Yeah. So ballet had, had gone the furthest along the way, but, um, again, it was, um, it was, uh, a strange fit. There was. Um, a market, if you could get it for two hundred dollars, and um, which uh, Commodore and the VIC twenty did, um, but the 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 key there was uh, bypassing the TV set and going you know uh, of the RF modulator and getting eighty characters on the screen, so that or sixty four characters, something like that. So that really defined what a computer was, along with um, a full stroke keyboard. And anything that was compromised there was, uh, it just didn't fit. It was, uh, from a marketing standpoint, Radio Shack did a pretty good job because they had their own distribution channel and they could do things for a, a while, um, but that was, had its own little market segment. And uh, there was also this ambiguity of were you going to be hurting your game segment and your game marketing by calling it a computer? So uh, it was a, a tough market segmentation. Um, if we had started a very different company that was financed and, and with a, a clarity of vision, that would have been much, much, much better. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because the VCS itself is, you know, has the has the word computer in the name, right? So, what was what was the origin of that? I, I have no idea. Um, uh, good question. Uh, maybe Al could tell you that. Okay. Um, we thought that um, 
it was the idea that having the interchangeable cartridges, so I think it was the idea that the computer and the system sort of came together, the idea that uh, it was, uh, the people understood that you could repurpose it and it could be something different based on the software. I see. Um, and did, did Nolan disagree at, um, at any point with, um, with making the, the, the home computer or was he supportive of it? He had mostly checked out by that point. Uh, he was there yeah. um, and um, th that because of both the confusion and the, and the amount of money available, you know, with the Warner stuff and, and all the other things, um, th and we were riding up a high and uh, that we could do anything we want, you know, with the names. So uh, there, again, we had lost that, that hunger for refining a product and being certain of where it was going and what the key value atoms were. I think and by that time, Nolan just wanted something to, to go a, a opposite Apple without thinking what it was going to be. I see. Um, and um, did you have any involvement in in the Atari's later consoles or later computers? Um, I, there was just a little bit, but they were mostly repackages. Steve Bristow tried doing another one uh, with a different architecture, um, and I looked at trying to uh, change the 400 and 800 around uh, a bit, but uh, in my lab in New York, I was starting to work on a next generation computer using a 32-bit machine and a real computer. And uh, I started conversations with, uh, with a deck computer, because uh, they had the VAX on a chip. And I wanted to see whether I could get that, because it would step into software. Uh, uh, and that's where I've met uh, 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 Gwen and Gordon Bell and things like that and got uh, my first introduction to the Computer History Museum back in, on the East Coast before it moved out here. And um, DEC was having their own identity problems of are they a computer or not? Are they a personal computer or not? So the, uh, and I don't know if you introduced met Avram Miller, he was working on the DEX personal computer. So there was, it's very hard for a company to go against their DNA. They tried doing it, but it requires incredible leadership and a driver to go against their core DNA. I read that you were also involved in the beginnings of Chuck E. Cheese? Yes, um, that Chuck E. Cheese came out of Atari, so there was um, Nolan, always wanted a, to, for Atari to be bought by Disney, uh, but Disney never wanted to buy us. Um, but Nolan really wanted to have a Disneyland parks. So he came up with the idea of having many amusement parks in uh, shopping centers. This had a couple of advantages. First of all, uh, we couldn't sell any more coin-op, open up any more coin-op locations because zoning was, you know, uh, was pretty restrictive. But if you could put it into a, a food uh, service things, you could put pinball machines and things like that. Nolan also was one of the great secular philosophers. And one of his aphorisms, that kids decide, oh, parents decide when the kids go out for dinner, the kids decide where. And so we wanted to have a, uh, have you ever been to Bear Country Jamboree? Because Chuck E. Cheese is like a mini Bear Country Jamboree at Disneyland. Um, so uh, Grass Valley did the, uh, the animation, the animatronics for it. There was another company that uh, built the characters, and then we did the pneumatics and the programming 
the control uh, at uh, Nolan's place. Um, we had an offsite, and they were coming up with names for uh, it, uh, super cheese that had already been taken. I remember the meeting coming up with the name Chuck E. Cheese because super cheese has been taken. Other people at the meeting may have different memories, but I had, uh, had the cadence of Joey Lewis for whatever reason, and that became Chuck E. Cheese. Um, we did it. Nolan being typical Nolan, one of the corporate spokespersons being an eight foot high talking rat. Uh, it was the, one of the number one pickup places in San Jose on Saturday mornings because single uh, fathers would have the kids for the day on Saturday morning. So they would take them to Chuck E. Cheese. And if that's where the single fathers went, that's where the single mothers would go. It was, it was a strange scene, and it was just wonderful. And Nolan's idea was to take um, a high margin business, which was video games, with a low margin business, which was food, and marry the two together and have something for the whole family. <laughs> um, okay, so we've already um, discussed, started to discuss. Um, you're moving to New York um, and starting Warner's Labs. Um, could you talk about, um, you know, how that came about, and then, and then, you know, some of the major projects that you worked on um, there? So um, I first uh, went back to New York because um, Sesame Street Children's Television Workshop was doing a, something called uh, Sesame Place, and it was going to be amusement parks for kids, um, but they were mostly learning parks, and um, I was sort of the, the patron saint for weird projects at Atari, so they, they said, go back there and uh, see what the, the fib was. Um, I went back there and I said, um, by, the, by the time this was happening, um, I was having a little bit of cabin fever being in Grass Valley, California, and I was interested in getting back to New York. Um, Manny Gerard, the President Warner, uh, and I talked, and I said, I'd like to do a central research facility, see if we could bring some of the Atari magic to the other Warner divisions. So I started working with Warner Cable, uh, Warner Records, uh, Warner Publishing to see what the fits might be. Um, I, uh, and I did, uh, I also started a research facility for Atari back there where we were doing some games and also some consumer testing. Uh, that we were just getting going, but it was very hard and, and it required a, a different set of skills, which I didn't have, of how you interface a corporate resource to operational divisions. Uh, I was really spoiled by having Al and Nolan, you know, I could cut, come, just invent stuff. Nolan and Al say, great, we'll productize it, move it back there. And I didn't have to uh, develop the skills of how you move a, a project over and work within a corporation. So it wasn't a good fit. I could see uh, what was hap what needed to happen, but it was uh, a very different model of how you sell across divisions at a corporate level. Um, for me, it was fantastic because I learned about the history of books. I learned about the history of, of movies. I could see where the tools were, were going and it was a fantastic playground, but um, I didn't. Uh, Atari was starting to peak and go down by that point, so we didn't see the fruition of, of stuff that we might have been able to, to do. But I did see the importance of video games in the history of the six hundred, you know, of the history, the five hundred year history of storytelling 
and what they could do and not and um, we had uh, through Alan Kay who was working at Atari uh, relationship with Nick Negropani and some of the other people to see where storytelling could go in the future. Mm -hmm. Right, so like the idea that video games are a medium that was starting to be, become part of your consciousness. Exactly, I, uh, for a uh, couple of things that came out uh, from the association with Negroponte, one was, um, it wasn't, it was the introduction to Marshall McLuhan and, and understanding that this, this barrier here is, isn't as finite, that first it's going to be audio and visual, but it's going to be so many other things that are going to penetrate that barrier. Then there was, uh, um, there was Sherry Turkle who d uh, did the wonderful book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, to look at the taxonomy for storytelling um, along the way, it, you know, that was just great. And then, um, and then there was um, Reverend uh, Father um, McCulkin, I think as his name was, and he wrote about and came up with the wonderful aphorism that we create the stories, we form the, the tools and the tools form us. And my whole life, whether it was at a, Atari or at Ampex or when I was doing TV, it was about tool building. And now I work in museums and stuff like that. It's building the tool, tools for the real storytellers. And, and then you, you just turn it over. Uh, after Atari, I got very enamored with the ideas of uh, both Spielberg and um, you know, and uh, when he did the Shoah project where everybody has uh, a right to tell their story no matter how inarticulate they are. Um, so that's what got me interested in desktop print, you know, video publishing. And also uh, Coppola who had the idea that uh, he had, it was called uh, the Silver Oh, I would think he had outfitted uh, this trailer with all the tools for video production so that uh, what happened in the music industry was MIDI, so that anybody that wanted to do music had access to all the tools of music through MIDI interfaces. We wanted to have people that were storytellers to have all the tools of video storytelling because um, you know, Coppola said, you think of um, doing theatrical release movies as the auteur, uh, you know, but it was really a director with a bullhorn and 40 union people holding an 80 foot hold long paintbrush and saying, put the purple over there. And he wanted to have tools where people could tell other stories uh, with personal tools and collaborate, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. So um, I started taking what was video games and the video technology and saying, what, the next generation was not so much um, the home computer, but what happened in the, uh, the MIDI industry and, the, and what happened in 85 in the print industry of desktop publishing where you could have people having all the tools in real time to do video work. Mm -hmm. So b before we move on um, to digital effects, um, I wanted to sort of wrap up, um, you know, this, the story of Atari. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to discuss, you know, the the, the effect of the, the 1983 video game crash, um, how it affected Warner, how it affected the company, um, Atari, and, and maybe where you, know, where you were. Um, what, are, what are sort of the ripple effects? So um, um, by late 83, uh, 84, 
I could see what was happening and it was going to be too hard to change the ship. So I actually organized a meeting with Marita's son from Sony to see whether um, Atari and Sony could come together because it was just too hard to change the, the culture of given my limited social and, and interpersonal skills along the way. So you could see this starting to happen uh, along the way. Um, I, um, and the projects I started doing were outside of Atari, but seeing whether I could help some of the other d divisions of Warner. Uh, so I, um, I started d doing things with Warner Interactive and stuff like that because the, I uh, couldn't change Atari. Um, then um, in 85, uh, I, we were working on this you know, project uh, at, at the labs for video. We could see that everything was going to collapse. So I said to the Warner people, rather than writing off all the stuff that I was doing, uh, let me just do the spin-off of, of this. Uh, it was going to cost you N dollars to shut down the lab um, that um, give me that money, I'll take this and restart it in uh, the video project in Silicon Valley and got money from Kleiner Perkins. Um, and also during the war days, I met a young fellow. He was, or two people, they were 17 years old, Bobby Kotek and um, his partner. And um, uh, the collapse of Atari took down what Activision had become mediagenic. So uh, mm. I went on the board of uh, uh, Bobby's company and we took, we bought uh, mediagenic genic out of bankruptcy, took it down to I think two people and started rebuilding it from there. The only title we had at, at that time I think was Leisure Suit, Leisure Suit Larry. And um, our only other asset was a liability to uh, Magnavox on the Pong patent of the bulb bouncing back and forth. So uh, um, Bobby, uh, with a little bit of help from me, but it was mostly Bobby and Howard, uh, we rebuilt um, Activision one step at a time, renamed, renamed it from Mediagenic back to Activision because there was a strong love of that name and support and just built it one title after another. Um, and I stayed on the board um, until it got to uh, a fairly good size and then left the board and then uh, Bobby just kept building it and, uh, and did a great job. It was an easy job in the one sense. Um, our business plan was to follow uh, electronic arts um, Electronic Arts was uh, the McDonald's. So if they built on one corner, we would build on another corner. They could get Madden football, so we could get, uh, you know, for $25,000, Tony Hawk's skateboard. Uh, and just kept following them, because EA was always um, the model of, of the quality, and, and, uh, and we didn't have that much money. So we followed them. And, and I got a chance to participate in the rebuilding of the, of the industry. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the other, well, sorry. Oh, go ahead. The other part Where of the next? rebuilding of the industry was Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Nintendo with the NES <coughs> came to Atari to see if they would, um, uh, if we would license their console. Uh, their console, had a lot of similarities to what I wanted to do with the, the 400, 800. Um, in both price point, amount of memory, moving objects, and things like this, and tightly uh, tied to what gamers wanted. Um, so I think the NES was uh, what we wanted the 400 to be as a gaming machine. What Nintendo did, and in two other areas were fantastic. One was 
the when and uh, did, made it a closed system so they could maintain the quality because by the time when Atari was collapsing, everybody was making cartridges and there was just a, a whole bunch of junk out there and Nintendo said, it's a closed system, we don't care about the legal issues about being a closed system and the antitrust system. Let's just do it right where we can make sure that we can make sure that the games were right. Uh, which they did a great job on, and they didn't have any ambivalence of what, was it a game system or a computer system. They just did it fantastic. And then opening up the games of Mario and then uh, the Wii, uh, they deserve all the credit they can get. Um, yeah, so we were talking about um, your connection to, um, you know, where the game, in, game industry went. Um, did you did you ever reconnect back with Atari at all, or the, the later iterations of Atari? Um, that when Jack Tremiel uh, bought Atari, um, he asked whether I could go on the board or not of of uh, the new Atari, and um, it wasn't a good fit for me. But um, I got a chance to to get to know Jack better and follow that and talk. Did a little bit of advising with him on the Jaguar, but not much. Okay. Um, so let's go back to digital effects. Um, so you mentioned um, a spun out, um, and you know after the spin out, just talk about like what sorts of um, projects did you do? Um, what sorts of um, companies did you work with? Um, oh, for digital effects. Know, what sorts of things? Did yeah, for digital effects. Uh, so um, it was uh, we, I got funding through Kleiner Perkins, and my lead on that, and the board lead was Vinod Koslund. It was his first company after Sun. Um, um, I had the Dream Board and the Dream Investors. Uh, so John Warnock was on the board, um, and. Uh, through John, we tried doing some uh, accelerators for Photoshop. Um, on the board also was Mickey Shuloff, who was the head of Sony, Sony, and Marty Payson, who was the head of Warner. So, and who's who of VCs? Mitch Kapoor was an investor. Um, so what I had was, and I had both, uh, and I had. Um, uh, also, Intel was an investor. So this is the dream stuff, and th what I didn't realize was I had this 10,000 horsepower engine and a quarter inch drive shaft, and, uh, and what I learned as, as uh, the head of the company is that these VCs have a portfolio of a hundred companies, as uh, as uh, head of this company, I had a portfolio of one company, and they were designed to go ahead and drive this to the maximum. You know, because they were looking at return on partners' time, so they were tiling the not, the dial up to eleven, and it takes a really strong president. Uh, well, I was actually chairman of the board to say. No, this is what we can do, because you have all these great people. So we tried doing a little too much, and we kept going for the world's de most demanding customers, because the idea is, if you worked at the very top level, you would build your um, your company name, and then you could filter it down to the less demanding customers. So we discovered the world's most demanding customers. That was really, you know. Um, and they demanded things. Uh, our very first customer uh, was, uh, they were going into post for Star Trek The Next Generation. We were still coding the machine. And they were getting ready for post. Um, uh, we had a, a good machine. And we achieved, uh, at the highest level of production, what we hadn't expected was a trade war between 
uh, Japan and the U.S. And that killed us from a couple of standpoints. We had projected memory cost to go down, and there was a trade war that started between the two. So memory costs were actually going up. And also, Sony wanted to uh, put the axe in, into the um, heart of Ampex, which was still making analog video tape recorders. So we had assumed the whole video industry was going to go from analog to digital. Sony wanted to bring out another couple of generations of analog tape recorders to drive uh, Sony into the ground. And then uh, the other thing that happened during that time was the savings and loan crisis. And our bank was Silicon Valley Bank at the time. And the auditors came into Silicon Valley Bank and started pulling the credit lines and everything like that. So we were uh, in a multi-level squeeze. Um, and uh, we, we couldn't survive our, our way through that. We took the technology and placed it with uh, Aldous and Adobe. So the technology uh, as a desktop uh, technology lived on. We got uh, an Emmy for our work in pioneering desktop uh, publishing. So that was gra gratifying along the way. And I did some consulting uh, with the the technology as, as it worked its way through Adobe and Aldous. Uh, and then later on, that's one of the things that brought me back working with Apple, because uh, Steve Jobs had brought in uh, from micro, Macromedia, I think it was, uh, uh, Final Cut Pro. So I helped work with that, and then later on became more involved with Apple. Uh, on their video projects. Okay, um, so could you explain exactly what the technology was, number one, and also number two, what the products were, what the business models yeah. was? So digital effects, the products, the, at the high-end product, um, we, the, the goal was to, at the highest uh, level, was real-time video manipulation. So you could consider it a single polygon 3D device that could map real-time video onto the polygon in real time. So you could rotate it, you could morph it, and then you could also bring in background layers for foreground and compositing of images. So you can manipulate real images in real time. And now you do this on your iPhone, on your Macintosh, uh, this was 40 years ago and 35 years ago. And the most we could handle is one, two, or three images. And this device sold for $60,000. And, uh, and it also brought in all the elements of video production. So it had editing, it had a paint system, it had a titling system, it had graphics, it had everything else. So the idea was a a workstation for real-time video, and that was at the high end. Then we wanted to do, and we brought out a lower cost version of that that didn't have the full real-time digital graphics to sell for the couple of thousand dollar range for analog uh, um, editing for to hook up with your VHS uh, and your Betamax tape recorders and your Mac tape recorders. So it was the very high-end D1 digital editing and a consumer, uh, but it was really for the videographer and uh, the desktop uh, videographer who is doing weddings and, th and industrial. So, okay. so, so you, were, you were selling the hardware and the software together as a turnkey exactly, system? Exactly, it was a bundle. And then we also okay. had uh, a pre-visualization software-only version of it, so you could um, do some editing and some manipulating and some storyboarding, but uh, it was really oriented with, uh, for pre-visualization. 
Okay. Um, but you weren't actually doing like being do like developing effects for f um, like you mentioned Star Trek: The Next Generation. Like you weren't actually producing the effects for them. You were just selling the it systems go, to another effects house. Yeah, our equipment was bought by the post houses, and they would uh, it would replace their uh, Grass Valley switcher, their Ampex uh, ADO editor, their uh, Quantel paint system, the Chiron tiling system. So it was all brought into one box with one database uh, that you could edit. Okay, okay. Um, so then the timing wise, so then digital effects closed in what year? Um, that's a good question. Um, in the early 90s, I said like um, earlier mid 90s. So okay. there was a, a period of roll up. Uh, there were weak, uh, around the valley, there were weaker video companies. And so what happened was the VC said, take on these other companies. So there was one company that was doing audio work, uh, the equivalent uh, of both editorial and Foley work and, and long form editing. So we brought them in and some others, and we were trying to do the roll up. But uh, the video industry was going through a tough time and the capital industry during that time was a tough time. So uh, it was right on the edge that we were a couple of years before the Mac in a native way could do all this stuff. And it was sort of the last ages of, of, of the analog and the early ages of all the stuff you could do on the Macintosh. And the idea was we were going to cause space in between them and help the industry transition before the other. But the money dried up in between, so the world just sort of jumped right to the Macintosh mm -hmm. and doing stuff with that. And people would accept not doing stuff in real time in return for just having a software-only pro product. So mm -hmm. uh, with startups and stuff like that, as they say, it's great to, um, if you're on the razor's edge, to make sure you're behind the, the edge instead of in front of the razor's edge. <laughs> um, so then you continue to consult in the years after that? Or, um, you know, what's, uh, what, what did you do after that? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, I did consulting for Intel and for Apple. And then uh, my love was uh, pro bono working on museums. Uh, ah. So if you think of uh, a video game, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a theater. It's a theater that has lighting, it has, uh, it has sound, it has where, you, uh, uh, where the audience can sit, and you put in uh, the content is the actors and, and the writers. So it's a black box theater where you, uh, that you could now make it into anything you want. If you think of a good museum, it's, it's a device, it's a theater for storytelling. You're standing in front of this object that was created by somebody 3,000 years ago and it has a story to tell. So how do you take that that object and uh, one, there was a, a museum operator, a museum critic that said, museums, that's where objects go to dance, to die. So this is how you can now take the storytelling that we learned in video games and take the real object and let people understand that that object was created in a time and place by somebody and that has a story to tell and how to do it with respect for the scholarship behind uh, that story because people, you know, they're uh, curators and things like that. So you have to completely respect the object, but you have to allow people into the object using the skills that we learned in video games. Now, I got into that n not because uh, I was great at these things, that uh, if you're in a museum, your first concern is how do you raise money? 
and I came from the video game in Silicon Valley, so they said, this guy must have a lots of money. So people from um, Silicon Valley get invited into all sorts of places, and we pretend to know what we're talking about, and the museums pretend to listen. But that starts a dialogue that's interesting, and if um, the Silicon Valley people come to it with the humility, saying, these people on the other side have an expertise, and, and th these stories are absolutely wonderful. And if the museum people are willing to look at that transition as museums being not only the collection of artifacts, but are places for public gathering and where the interaction with the public becomes absolutely key, and you use that as the surface, then wonderful things can happen. It's not an easy um, thing to negotiate because in museums, their main asset is history, and in Silicon Valley, our main liability is history. They wish history would just go away so you can invent a new thing without having to worry about backwards compatibility. So, but if you go at it with both ways, wonderful things can happen. Mm -hmm. I also understand that you've taught courses at universities. Um, I would be invited in uh, and I would be an adjunct, uh, do some adjunct work and things like that. Uh, that um, it was mostly in, uh, encouraging people to say what are experiences, what worked, what failed, and to encourage people to go forward uh, along with their things and, um, and taking the Silicon model of, the Silicon Valley model of failing forward and taking it to other institutions that may not be quite as open for, for that and negotiating uh, what the digital tools can do but also what they can't do and, and how to uh, handle that negotiation between um, uh, scholars, artists that are working in, in other traditions and the worlds that we have in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And you've also testified before Congress and other government agencies? Yeah, a couple of times, yes. Um, so part of it was uh, uh, very early on in the switching of uh, um, uh, solar and alternate energy. But uh, during the um, uh, late 70s and the early 80s, Congress was trying to figure out what to do uh, with this new digital technology, how they could support the, the technology, what's the role of copyright law and things like this. And um, so what is the role in Congress? And I also, um, congressmen lo love to stand in front of Silicon Valley people and say, we're embracing the future. Uh, so it was, it was great theater. Um, so sometimes we go there and, uh, and talk a little about what we needed. And it was really encouraging uh, support for education uh, for, of the hearts and the digital and bringing two, the two together. And also there was a change in the regulatory framework coming out of uh, the uh, Nixon-Reagan days of what's the role of patents, what's the role of co copyright, and things of that nature. And then um, there was a group of people looking to see what do you, what's the role of teaching of technology in, in computers in, uh, in brick and mortar education. So sometimes you get invited in for those discussions. Right, so you were on the California State Tax Force for um, education? I, it, it was, uh, uh, it, 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 yes, it was, it was a period of time. It didn't meet that often, and computers were coming in, and what are they going to teach? Are they going to teach um, the ability to type? Uh, what's the role in there and things like that? And for, uh, 
it was absolutely amazing for me because you know the textbook people were in the teachers union were in the, the room uh, the uh, everybody was in the room and everybody had a vested interest but there was n there weren't the kids in the room and and then you realize that how hard the d discussion is because everybody was not everybody but most of the people were well-meaning but coming at it from their area and by the time everybody threw in their two cents worth it became an overly uh, constrained problem and not much was going to happen and at the end of the day there wasn't going to be funds for teacher training and and support to really do a good job so uh, that all disappeared but I did see one project that Apple did called the Vivarium and I, it was just beyond beautiful to see what a well financed and well supported and teachers that have come up from uh, the Makos uh, constructed this idea of teaching and, and teachers that had great classroom management and everything what they could do and you could see it was just really fantastic so I would encourage any of the people that are looking at what what technology should do now and particularly AI and stuff like that to look at these programs that were driven by teachers that really understood classrooms oh wow yeah the vivarium was uh, that was an Alan Kay project it was an Alan Kay project they put all that technology in and I'll use the F word, it was that kind of disaster. And it was to the credit of Apple, to Alan Kay, to the teachers and the supervisors saying, all this technology doesn't work, what does work? And they went back and re-engineered it and they found out what good teachers, what good technologists, and enough time and enough respect for everybody could do. And it was really spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we were mentioning patents before. Um, I take it you, you have a number of patents in computing and multimedia. Could you discuss those? Um, some of those were because I didn't know what was happening at Xerox Park. <laughs> uh, so we were reinventing a few of the things at a park. Um, Atari did not aggressively go after patents um, because as I said back in the days of Nixon in the 60s if you asserted your patents you would get into antitrust issue so Ron and I would do some patents whenever we needed a new appliance because Atari would give us a thousand dollars for every new patent if Ron and I would, were co-inventors that would be five hundred dollars for each so after tax, that would allow us to buy a new major appliance. Uh, so you could go back and see what Atari could have, the intellectual property portfolio that it could have had along the way. Um, so my were, patents were mostly a few on the system and moving objects around, but it's only a fraction of what we could have done. Okay, so these are all patents related to the VCS or the or the and the home computer, computer and a few of the coin op games. Okay, but uh, um, it was interesting to see how patents, you know, moved uh, from what was in the uh, late '60s to by the '80s, early '80s, how important they could be. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, situate Atari in the technology and cultural landscape of the 70s. Um, you know, you mentioned Apple grew out of Atari. We have like Intel, Microsoft, the microprocessor, Berkeley and the counterculture. You know, what, what was, what was, you know, what are all these components? Let me, let me rephrase that. What, like what, how did the culture of Atari arise out of the mixture of all these influences yeah. in the environment um, it starts you know and it gets almost to the finish line with Nolan Nolan was our Mick Jagger <laughs> um, 
I, uh, uh, he understood games, but um, Atari was the meta game. We all knew we were going to fail, so we always had our plan B and C. Um, and back at uh, at uh, at Grass Valley, we had multiple companies, so no two companies were on credit hold at the same time. And Nolan uh, created that sense of of having fun about doing this. There's no fear of failure. We had a trophy for the the biggest the biggest mess up ever, and that trophy went from person to person. So if you had good failures, that was a great thing. So that culture was really important. So Al, uh, Nolan set that culture of the fun. You know, we were working in an entertainment industry uh, where people that we liked each other, and uh, it wasn't going to be life and death. Al took the culture of Ampex, which was the culture of hard engineering and engineers knowing the customer. Because at Ampex, we knew the customer. Al, early on, set up a coin-op route for the engineers at Atari, not to make money to compete with our customers, but so that the engineers understood what the, our coin-op customers needed to do. So if you are emptying a coin box at 2 o'clock in the morning at a Greyhound bus depot with all these quarters, and the quarters are rolling all, all over the ground, you would change the design of the coin box for the next time. So uh, they were the two cornerstones for, for setting the culture. Um, um, that Al's biggest job was to, he had a secretary, and his secretary would let Al know whenever Nolan wanted to go into the labs because he would then run to the labs to intercept Nolan, because if Nolan goes into there, he would generate so much enthusiasm and change every single project, and nothing would ever get done. So Al's job was to keep the projects moving ahead and moving the technology move ahead. So the two of them were absolutely key. Um, so that introduced a different model for companies, for uh, Don Valentine and the VCs that followed Don, Don Valentine. It introduced, um, you know, it, it helped set the market, the, you know, um, Apple and some of those, and um, for a different market, and Moaz and Jobs had a different sensibility, but there was that sense of excitement of knowing the customer, uh, and particularly for Waz, it was building something that the that the uh, somebody in the homebrew club uh, could see and understand and that was could be really proud of and that was the culture uh, at Apple and a lot of that came out of Atari um, then it, the consumer people that came after us you know with uh, you know at home and stuff like that uh, it it blended bringing the consumer in, th that start bringing in the Warner culture and with marketing, advertising. So that became the benchmark for at home and some of the other consumer companies uh, and consumer facing companies after that. And uh, not to minimize the fact that when Atari was making money, uh, that uh, uh, invigorated the VC community. They saw the numbers and uh, they started making the money. First, uh, act, uh, it was Electronic Arts was the first independent software company you know, to take money and they were doing games for the computer uh, and then Activision. So it, it changed the whole ecology of the valley and it started rippling. The, the kids at um, at a UC and Stanford in the engineering school and the business school saw the model of that's who they wanted to be. So you, you start seeing that affect it downstream. So um, 
uh, Stanford did a better job of changing the curriculum and start providing courses to feed the student's interest. So the, uh, I think Stanford did a really jo good job of following what happened at Atari and Apple and creating uh, the, the food chain, the big end of the funnel for the kids coming in. So what are what other thoughts do you have about the legacy of the Atari VCS, um, the the eight bit home computers, and Atari's role in in the video game and PC industries? So I think there's a couple of um, important legacies. Um, the one that's by far the most gratifying is uh, kids coming up to you saying, you know, uh, they were dorks, they were wherever. They had never seen a computer and things like that. And that allowed them to uh, study it, enter their careers, and they're the, now the industry now. So that's by far the, the most important legacy. Um, that the other thing is, I hadn't realized it until you start looking back at uh, the video games at 50 years and we, uh, you probably already know the market. If you take the print industry, uh, the film industry, and the music industry, and combine all those three industries, and then double that, that's the size of the video game industry. Uh, so it was, we were privileged to help uh, create a new story form, you know, a form of storytelling uh, that, you know, the last equivalent form was the 1920s. So to be part of that um, and to see that as a new form of storytelling and then to watch what people are doing now with it as storytelling and to now map that with what we talked about with uh, Marshall McLuhan bringing in all the senses uh, coming through you know, and that th this membrane is going to be amorphous uh, uh, for all the other ways of storytelling and the sherry turkle of all the other forms of touring storytelling that there might be and the tools for storytelling that anybody that has a story that they want to tell they can now make it into a game uh, and that the games will affect you know the, how you do education how you do important things because the most important technology in video, in education, is not video games. It's and you learn this in museums is to get people to engage their uh, imagination. Uh, when you go into a museum and you have to add, and you look at an exhibit and you say, um, "Why is the neck of the giraffe that that long?" and uh, it's the Jesuit model. Once you've got them uh, to ask a question, you've got them for life. So now, video games are now uh, with the new tools and the, uh, for storytelling, AI, and all these other things, that there's new ways of engaging people to ask questions and, and to tell their stories in the context of video games or interactive movies or some blend of any of those. Thank you. Okay, one final question. If you had to give one word of advice to a young person today, uh, what would it be? My, actually, my one word is um, try. Um, to try everything, to be open to all sorts of things, and the world will tell you uh, uh, what excites you, where your, your place in the world is going to be, and how you're going to create value, but to try as many things as possible and with as many people as possible.